God takes over, and I'm, I'm blown away, and I realize that um, God can and will use people if they're willing to be, you know, willing to let Him. Worship in itself, as we said, it comes from the heart. While there's a wrong way, there's not one right way to do it. But, but I definitely believe when I step aside and don't rely too much on my own ability, that just amazing things happen. It's another week of Inside the Bible, a weekly podcast with spiritual insights on biblical truth. Welcome, my name's Andrew Inman, and this week we begin a brand new series in the book of Judges, chapter 13, where we tackle the life of Samson. I'm kind of excited about this, really excited to get into the life of Samson, because much like our prior study into the life of Joseph— we're going to find many similarities between Samson and Christ. But in a way, we're going to see a lot of contrasts too. The similarities being that he is a figure of Christ and that he is a salvation to Israel who find themselves in bondage. But because of his might and strength, in contrast to Christ's weakness physically, Samson had weaknesses spiritually. Whereas Jesus, being weak and God in the flesh, I mean weak as in physically, had spiritual strength because he was God in the flesh and morally dependent on his Father. That's a significant difference. We'll get into more of that later. But first, we have to start at the basis. And here is another similarity between Samson and Jesus Christ, the one that we're going to start with. An angel came to both Samson's mother and Jesus' mother's Mary, and basically foretold their coming, saying, you will bear a child who will become the salvation to both the world and to Israel. Samson's case, it was Israel. Jesus' case, it was Israel and the rest of the world. But what we'll find in the case of Samson is that He is predicted to be mighty physically. He's going to have a lot of might physically. And yet, that is going to be his biggest downfall. In chapter 13 of Judges, it says that the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. When you read all throughout the Old Testament, and this is especially true in Judges and the book of Kings, and in the book of Chronicles, and books related. The children of Israel were known for doing evil in the sight of the Lord, turning away to their own foreign gods made with hands. They were known to turn away from God, forgetting the book of the law, and forgetting their covenant with God from past times. And a generation would arise that did not know the Lord, and they would fall away. And God's response? Well, in this case, like many other cases, they would get delivered into the hands of a nation. A nation that did not know God, that did not practice godliness. And after so many years, they would finally be delivered by God and his sovereign decision to say, Okay, they've had enough time to bring the nation back to me. And this is one of those cases. Israel fell into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. In 40 years, this nation of Israel was being controlled by their common enemy, the Philistines, who were known to be a constant enemy of Israel, even into the the time of David. They were constantly kind of a thorn to Israel, a nation that they were always fighting. But there was a certain man of Zorah and a family of the Danites, which would be a tribe of Israel, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren. And she did not bear, but the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said unto her, Behold now, you are barren, and you do not bear. But you shall conceive and bear a son. Up to this point, you haven't been able to bear a child. 
but now you will finally have that child. Now, therefore, beware, I pray you, that, that you drink not wine, nor strong drink, or eat not of any unclean thing. For lo, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. The Nazarites, not to be mistaken for Nazarenes, which interestingly enough, Jesus did live in Nazareth for some of his childhood and would classify as a Nazarene, and yet they aren't the same thing. Nazarites, which were a group of people who were to abstain from certain pleasures of the world, not because they were sins, but because they were pleasures that could lead into sin. They wanted to live a holy life, dedicated to God, full-heartedly, constantly, And they didn't want to have those distractions and by the command of the Lord would not drink wine, would not touch dead carcasses, and as a symbol of their dedication to the Lord would grow out their hair with no razor coming upon their head to cut it. A common misconception among people is that Samson's strength came from his hair. Those who read the Word, though, and have actually read the story know that it wasn't his hair. His hair was merely a sign of his relationship with the Lord. Much like a ring is a sign of your relationship with your wife or your husband, but it does not constitute your love for them. How many men do we see wearing a ring? And yet, they don't show any respect or sacrificial love for their wife. Just because they wore a ring and said some promises. Well, in the same way, a Nazarite, which was meant to grow out his hair, to represent his dedication, his long, life-lasting commitment to the Lord, how many of them could easily go back on that promise when no one was looking? It wasn't just that they weren't to drink wine, but they weren't to eat grapes, which was a common food in Israel. It wasn't a sin to eat it, but the whole idea was you don't even travel into a vineyard because the temptation To drink wine can lead to the temptation of drunkenness. So why even get close to sin? Why even get close to temptation knowing it can lead to sin? Just avoid the pleasure altogether. Which was what the angel of the Lord wanted for Samson. He wanted his life to not just be holy, but to resemble holiness. For there to be signs of his holy walk with the Lord. So he says, you do not bear now, you will bear. Therefore, you abstain from strong drinks and do not eat any unclean thing. For lo, you shall receive or conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head. For the child will be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible, that is to say, awesome. His countenance was awesome, awe-inspiring, just amazing. But I asked him not whence he came from. Neither told me he his name. But he said unto me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. 
For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which you did send come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. I like Manoah's response to his wife's attentiveness to the Lord's word. It isn't often in culture and I'm not going to say in today's world, I'm going to talk about in general, it isn't often that men are attentive to their wives. Their wives give some spiritual declaration of their experience with the Lord when they spend personal time with the Lord. And they come to their husbands and say, oh, I had this inspiring moment with God. He revealed this to me, and I really want to share it in church today. And the husband says, no, you can't share that. It's embarrassing to me. No, you can't. Because though the wife was attentive, intentional about hearing God speak, the husband's not intentional about hearing what God revealed to his wife. It's kind of interesting how it's in the nature of women to be more open to hearing the voice of God. And maybe God speaks to the women in the relationship because the husband just is not so attuned to it. They're not so open to hearing God speak all the time by nature. Because we by nature want to do it on our own. I know my wife can correct me a lot of times in my character. She just has that way about correcting my my flaws. And I don't like to be corrected, and that's why I need to be corrected, because without a wife, I'd do it all on my own. Do things my own way. Would not receive any input. But a woman seems to have this open ear to God that men don't always have. Men can have an open ear to God, but sometimes the wife seems to have more of an open ear, which is why, men, you ought to be considerate of your wife's input when she feels that God is speaking in the moment. Not to dismiss what she says about what God had said to her, but be so open as Manoah here in the text, who went so far as to take what his wife said, then go to the Lord and say, Lord, send the man to us again and teach us what we shall do. Now to add to that, Manoah's response, not just listening to his wife, but recognizing that the blessing is a responsibility. There are times God blesses us. And we can get a pretty good blessing from the Lord and yet not ask him, how can I be responsible with this? A blessing falls in our lap. Maybe a new house. Might be a new car. Might be a new job. Might be a new child. And how many of us consult the Lord and say, Lord, now teach me how to be responsible in this way. Manoah says, let's go to the Lord and ask him for the man to come back to us to teach us how we shall raise the child. That's an important request. To take God's blessings in thankfulness and in good faith unlike Abraham's wife, who laughed it off, accept it in good faith, but then respond by saying, now, Lord, you tell me how to use this for your purpose, for your glory. So that you don't just take the blessing and use it for less than what the godly potential is. How important to respond like Manoah did here. 
He entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which you did send come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened unto the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man has appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spake unto the woman? And he said, I am. Funny how the angel came to the woman a second time. Why? Men have this drive to work. To always work, always. It might not be housework, it might not be labor work, but to always be do, doing something. There's definitely a big difference between me and my wife whenever it comes to our constant hobbies. She's the type to want to relax. I'm the type to want to be up and moving and a little bit more active in some ways. And it might be for that same reason that the angel came to the woman. Because while he's working and constantly focused on what's, what's before him, the laboring in the field and such things, She's resting, waiting on the Lord to speak to her. It's kind of an interesting contrast between men and women. The women always seem to be in a place to hear God's voice so that they can go to their husbands and say, this is what the Lord said. Men can be open to hearing God. Men, as they're laboring or doing whatever it is they're doing in their spare time, can set their thoughts on the Lord, but they can also be easily distracted, sometimes tend to be. But my mom was always intentional about getting up at five in the morning to read her Bible and spend time with the Lord. Five or 5.30 in the morning is such an early time. Yet that's the time she would spend with God, and she would spend time with God periodically throughout the day. Something about the nature of a female that focuses on hearing the voice of God, or at least being in a place to hear the voice of God, which is not so often for men. So the wife comes to her husband, and she says, The angel returned. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Are you the man that spoke unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat anything that cometh to the, from the vine, that is to say, no grapes. Neither let her drink wine, nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing that I command her. Let her, dis, let her observe. All that I command her, let her observe. Now why the commandment for the mother and the son? Why the commandment for the parents? altogether, that applies to the son. The son's going to be a Nazarite. He can't drink strong drink. He can't even eat the grapes. Has to grow his hair out. Can't eat any unclean thing or even touch any dead animals. So why does God command that for the parents? Because the children learn from the parents. 
Growing up, my parents would say, you can't drink coffee, and I would think, why? You get to do it. The kid has that drive in them. Where if the parent says don't do something, but the parent does it anyways, the kid's going to want to do it. Now, there are times where your kid's just going to have to suck it up. And you'll have to be responsible in the things that you do to make sure your kid's never in a place to copy after you until he's at the age that's appropriate. Take, for instance, driving. You don't give a four-year-old kid access to your keys. And you may not have a choice but to have to drive because that's the society we live in today. But there's other cases too. You tell your child not to smoke and yet you smoke a pack a day? Tell your kids you don't want them living the life of alcohol and drug abuse, but you do it yourself? Tell your son to respect a woman and you don't respect your wife? How is your child supposed to learn when you don't take the initiative to be perfect in what you do. I know perfect is a strong word because none of us are perfect. We're not bound to be perfect, and yet that's what we're striving for. We're striving our hardest to be perfect because God is perfect, and we want everything we do to set the example, even though we know we'll, we'll fall short. How can you expect your kids to take the initiative, to have respect, to fear the Lord if you first don't fear the Lord? And in the same way, the angel's saying that here. You need to fear the Lord and take the initiative to practice the practices that your son will practice, even though you yourself are not expected to be the Savior of Israel. In this trying time, as the Philistines are coming on to you, oppressing the nation, be the example for your son. We will stop right here in this study, in the book of Judges, chapter 13, and we'll pick up next week on verse 15, to continue our study in the life of Samson. In the meantime, may the Lord bless and keep you and the way you should go this week. God bless.